In baseball, basketball, and football, teams play against each other, but in the body of Christ, we fight for each other. I recently read a depressing article in the Washington Post, how many churches are not going to survive the pandemic because of digital divide and because of economic calamity. We've just constructed a million dollar studio here at New Birth, and I wanna extend a hand of brotherhood to the churches in DeKalb County who don't have the technology or the equipment to be able to share the gospel with your congregation. We wanna open it up. All you have to do, if you are a pastor in DeKalb County, email partnerships at newbirth.org. We'll allow you to come in, tape a message, a sermon, a prayer, or whatever it is that you wanna share with your congregation. And here's the good news, it's for free. We want to be a blessing simply because we want to see your church win. Tag your bishop, tag your church, and let them know in this hour, we are family. With our hands lifted up, we lift up our worship to you, Father. We lift up our praise to you. It doesn't matter where you are. You could be watching on your, your iPad, your computer, your cell phone. Why don't you just make wherever you are your sanctuary and just begin to lift up your hands and your voice to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Just begin to worship with us this evening. Let's just lift up our praise. My hands are lifted up. Glory to God. My heart is ready to receive a blessing from you. Yes. A blessing from you. Help me say. Come on, help me say, my heart is ready. Come on. My heart is ready to receive a blessing from, a you. Blessing from you. Ah, anybody need a blessing wherever you are, just come on, raise it, say it. A blessing from you. Get yourself in the position to receive a blessing. My hands are lifted. My hands are lifted up. Come on, say, my heart is ready, say it. My heart is ready to receive a blessing from you ah anybody really need a blessing a blessing from you a blessing from you come on everybody one more time say my hands are lifted up my hands are lifted up yes they are my heart is ready my heart is ready my heart is ready, heart is ready to receive a blessing from you Jesus. a blessing from you you know you need a blessing. Come on, get yourself in, in a position to receive a blessing. A blessing from you. Now tonight, let's pray this prayer. Break me, make me, shake me, mow me, say it. Break me, make me, shake me, mow me. My heart is ready. My heart is ready. To receive. To receive. A blessing from you. A blessing from you. Ah, Father, we're ready for a blessing. A blessing from you. A blessing from you. Get yourself in a position to receive it. Break me, make me, shame me, mold me. Break me, make me, shake me, shake me, mold me. Mold me. Mold me. Say 
again. Say it. Thank you for my blessing. For my blessing. Say it again, y'all. Thank you for my blessing. For my blessing. For every blessing. One more time. Thank you. One more time, let's lift up our praise to our Lord tonight. My hands are lifted up, yeah, yes. My heart is ready to receive a blessing from you. I'm ready, Lord. I'm ready, Lord, for a blessing from you. Now take a moment and just give him worship. Come on, just take a moment and give him worship. Just lift your hands wherever you are and give the Lord worship. I'm not just lifting up my hands for a blessing. I'm speaking over my atmosphere. I'm speaking over my children. I'm speaking over my home. I'm speaking over my body, my health. Corona, you can't take me out. I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. You ought to just say that I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. Speak it over your house. Speak it over your children. Speak it over your home. Speak it over your body. I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. And I'll make this declaration. No weapon that's formed against me shall prosper. Guess what? It won't work. No weapon formed against me glory to God shall prosper it won't work let's worship together everybody no say no weapon formed against me shall prosper say it won't work it won't work say it again come on no weapon formed against me you want to say it over yourself shall prosper decree and declare it won't work I'm so grateful that God will do what he said he would do he will stand by his word he will come through God Shall prosper. It won't work. Say it. It won't work. One more time. Say it. No weapon formed against me. I'm speaking to my new birth family. Shall prosper. It won't work. It won't work. Ah. There just ain't one. There just ain't one. There just ain't one. There just ain't just stay right there, y'all, and say, There just stay one. There just stay one. There just stay one. The weapon may be formed, but there just stay one. It won't prosper. There just stay one. Corona, you can't have me. There just stay one. Corona, you can't have me. There just stay one. 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 I'm covered by the blood. I'm covered by the blood. I'm covered by the blood. They're just saying. Just stay one. 
concerns. If you call after him, he will answer. I want to encourage you, challenge you to extend your prayer life while we're under quarantine. God yearns to hear your voice, hear your petition. I read a meme just the other day that said, Jesus doesn't have COVID-19. It's okay to get close to him. Let's be intentional about our walk with God that while we're distanced from other people, we are never distanced from heaven. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been in a series that I want to invite you to continue on this journey with me. It's in Exodus chapter 1, and while you're going there, would you indulge me in inviting somebody to be a part of our group therapy, our midweek uh, Bible study as we delve into the Word of God. Exodus chapter 1, I want to look at verses 15 through 17. Here's what it says in the New International Version. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shephira and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that it's a boy, kill him. But if you see it's a girl, let her live. On this Tuesday night, I want to talk about facing conviction. Facing conviction. It's a part of our series, The Midwife Crisis. Facing conviction. This is part four in the series. I'll never forget uh, seeing an incident while I was a student uh, on the news uh, where uh, Reverend Al Sharpton was the object of an attempted murder by a misguided, mentally challenged man. It occurred while he was leading a march through Brooklyn around the death of Yousef Hawkins, who was in fact killed in a racially charged incident. As the demonstration was getting underway, the assailant stabbed Reverend Sharpton in the chest with a five-inch knife. Was immediately uh, sequestered into an ambulance and had to fight for his breath. The physicians told him that it was the grace of God that he didn't sneeze. After a few days in the hospital, he was discharged. And in an interview, uh, he said that the very first phone call he received after the attempt on his life was from his mother. And Mother Shopton asked Reverend Al Shopton a question he wasn't prepared for. Here, what she asked him, she asked him, are you going to forgive him? It fell on him like a ton of bricks because he had ascribed his entire life around the philosophy of Martin Luther King Jr. and had never entertained the notion about forgiving him. He said it was in that moment that the ideals of his life had to come into full balance. He had to figure out whether or not what he was doing was out of conviction or just conversation. A lot of us come to that crossroads in life. Are we really following our convictions or are we just talking? You say you're a believer. You say you are a follower. You say you are submitted to the will of God. And here's the test. Can you forgive them? Can you forgive the one that broke your heart? Can you forgive the one that betrayed your trust? 
Can you forgive the one that set you up for failure and disaster? It's in that moment that you've got to clutch your own pearls and figure out, am I just having conversation or am I convicted? The amazing thing about conviction is that conviction doesn't play sides. It's not evil or good. Mahatma Gandhi changed the entire landscape of the politics of India because of his convictions. We saw democracy in a new world order. How we saw what it meant to operate in passive aggressive, passive resistance because of his convictions. That same symmetry of thought, isn't it amazing? That halfway around the world from Mahatma Gandhi was Adolf Hitler. And Adolf Hitler, in fact, obstructed everything that we know in terms of the decency towards humanity. And he did all of it because he was standing on his convictions. I want to know, have you been convicted by what you believe in? Convicted by what it is that you profess? Convicted by what you pledge allegiance to? because conviction knows no moderation. I'll never forget before I took on this assignment uh, here at New Birth Cathedral in Atlanta, I was pastoring a church in uh, Baltimore, Empowerment Temple, and I went to go see a, a kingly gentleman by the name of Mr. Wright, who was in the last stages of cancer. He was in the last stages of cancer and uh, he had heard about this new unproven drug. And he began to plead with his doctors, let me try it. The reality is that you couldn't have access to it until you were in the last phases. The physician said to Mr. Wright, we can't give it to you, it's not completely proven. But Mr. Wright, holding on to his last decibel of hope and strength, said, I want to try it. I believe it can cure me. Against the doctor's better judgment, he gave him that prescription. A few days later, he came back and saw the once ailing man who was bedridden walking around his room. He had found himself on the road to recovery because he was convicted and convinced that the drug was working. He was in fact later discharged from the hospital and while he was home, his children brought him an article about the drug that he was taking, saying that most people would not survive. Within a few days, he relapsed. Relapsed and found himself back in Sinai Hospital. Too many weeks thereafter, regrettably, Mr. Wright slipped away and passed on to the other side. And in large measure, it wasn't because of the failure of the medication or the failure of the doctor. He died because of the failure of his conviction. As long as he believed he was going to get healed, as long as he was convinced that things were going to get better and things were going to change, he began to recuperate, began to regain his strength. But the moment he doubted, he felt all of his organs falling apart, all of his strength beginning to diminish. And the only thing that changed that you couldn't see registered on the chart was his convictions. I got to give to you a, uh, a moment of transparent testimony. Uh, we have been uh, under quarantine for five weeks and uh, somehow or another, I've lost my discipline for study while being strapped at home. I'm watching more movies than I'm reading books. I gotta get back on focus. How about while it is that I should have been reading, I almost have seen everything that Netflix has to offer. And I went to On Demand and I saw a movie that was in fact the inspiration to this message tonight. And that movie is a, a movie called Conviction. And in that movie Conviction, a young man who was raised on the wrong side of the tracks finds himself on the wrong side of the law 
he's accused of murder, is sentenced to jail without the possibility of parole, but his only begotten sister believes in him. She believes in him so strongly that she enrolls in law school because no lawyer would help her. She believes in him so passionately that she loses her husband and her two sons because they didn't share her conviction. Every appeal that was submitted, they lost. And 18 years later, her brother was freed because she knew in her heart he didn't do it. When the movie opened up and it is about a convict, I thought it was about the brother. I had no idea that the movie about being a convert, convict or being convicted was about the love story of a sister. And I asked in behind the scenes footage, how did you hold on when people doubted you? How did you not let go when you started to lose your family? How did you keep your head when all those around you was losing theirs? She said, because I had a conviction that my brother was free. I believe that there are some of you, the only thing that is giving you oxygen in a suffocating society is you are convicted that my child has got to survive what it is that they're in. You are convicted that there's got to be a bright side somewhere. You are convicted down into the marrow of your bone, right into the core of your conscience, that nobody told me the road was going to be easy. I just don't believe he's brought me this far to leave me now. What is your conviction? I often marvel at how it is that Dr. King and the stalwarts of the civil rights movement were able uh, to withstand people spitting on their face, barking dogs, nipping on their heels, fire hoses unleashed on their parents and on their children. How did you do it? It was because they maintained their conviction. I thought about this while I was reading Exodus chapter 1. And in Exodus chapter 1, you know the story if you've been with me the last two weeks, is that Pharaoh doesn't know who Joseph is, doesn't identify with dreamers, and he's trying to get rid of the minority class of people. And he enlists two uh, abortion clinicians named Shafira and Pua and gives them the job that when it is that you are in the delivery room, if you see a baby come out of the birth canal and it is a boy, kill him on spot. But if it's a girl, let him live. I got to pause here because over the last two weeks, I've been telling you about these nameless and faceless, uncelebrated superheroines, Shafira and Pua, and the Holy Spirit arrested me on something that I felt burdened to share with you on this Tuesday night. And that is, don't forget, Jamal, that Shafira and Pua initially took the job. They accepted it, checked off the terms, the pay was right, right where it is that they wanted to be. It put them in a place of professional advancement. There was nothing in the record that says that they prayed about it when the job was offered. They accepted it until they got into the delivery room. And when they got in the delivery room and when the women of Israel began to give birth, it was only then that they got convicted. Paul said, when I would do good, evil steps in my way. Do you know what is the worst thing about being saved? Nobody ever told you this. Your Sunday school teacher didn't tell you. Your pastor didn't tell you this. Your mother didn't even tell you this. The worst thing about being saved is having a conscience. There's some things that you could have done and would have done and used to do before you got in the covenant with God, but once you get convicted with the Holy Spirit, I looked at my hands, the reality is these are the same ashy hands 
I just can't do with them what I used to do. Same feet, but I can't go in the same places I used to go. Why? I am convicted. And I'm trying to figure out how it is that we have a generation of people who claim to be Christian, but never have any conviction about their consciousness. I don't know how it is that Governor Kemp has allowed thousands of people to go out in the streets of Georgia to go get tattoos, go get their manicure, go get their hair done, knowing that within four weeks, it's estimated on the low end of the totem pole that 10,000 people will die but no conviction of conscience. Trying to figure out how it is that we are singing almost the theme song from Woodstock. It's your thing. Do what you want to do. No conviction of conscience that I'm, I'm sharing a relationship with somebody who's married. I am assaulting my body with illegal drugs. No conviction of consciousness that I claim to trust him but I keep looking for a quick fix money scheme. When are you going to get convicted to declare unto God, not my will, but your will be done. You can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can fool God none of the time. There's got to be a conviction of conscience that I want God to disrupt my thinking pattern. I've got to have emblazoned, not on a bracelet or a t-shirt, but in my heart, I've got to be asking, what would Jesus do? And here they are, right at the delivery room, trying to figure out, do I follow the direction of the governor, of the Pharaoh, or am I obedient to the responsibility over my life? There's got to be some conviction. I'm reminded of uh, one of the most uh, renowned, astute, articulate preachers in the history of the black church. He's out of Nashville, Tennessee. Tennessee. His name is uh, Pastor uh, Kelly Smith. He's gone on to be with the Lord now. Pastor of the First Baptist Church in Nashville, Tennessee was doing a remarkable job. And a mega church in Ohio called him to be the pastor. It had all of the bells and whistles, had a great aggregation, had an unfathomable budget. Said, this is everything that I wanted in my ministry. He resigned, sent a letter to his church in Nashville, true story, and accepted the pastoral responsibility of this amazing mega church in Ohio. His first Sunday there, preached to a standing room capacity crowd was shaking hands at the back door, greeting all of his new members, all of his new leaders, all of his new parishioners. And he came to the end of the line and the secretary of the church came and said, Pastor Smith, you got a phone call in the office. Can you take it? Pastor Smith excused himself, went into the church office, took the phone. And there was the chairman of the deacon board of the church he left in Nashville. Said, Pastor Smith, we missed you today. Church wasn't the same. We just want to know when are you coming back home? Pastor Smith said he was convicted in that moment that he had followed the crowd but didn't follow Christ. He called an immediate meeting of the deacon board and said to the deacons, I need you all to know today was my first and my last Sunday. Thank you. What it is that you've offered me, I've never been paid before. The house that you've extended to me, I've never lived in before. The kind of car you offered me, I've never even seen that model before. But my conviction says I got to go back to where I'm assigned. And I'm believing that there's some of you who are sitting on the stool of indecision. You accepted the terms. You believe that because there's an increase, it must be God. And God is saying, you don't even understand, you're killing off your destiny. You're killing off your future. You're killing off your assignment. Why? Because you have no conviction. God is calling us in this hour to be convicts. 
that I am a yokesman of the gospel. I'm convinced and I am convicted that a whole lot of money doesn't mean I'm anointed, but a whole lot of grace does. I'm convicted and I'm convinced. I don't have to be in a church building to have a relationship with him. I'm convicted and I am convinced that I can't take my health for granted. Every day that I wake up is a blessing. I'm convicted and I am convinced that I don't deserve his mercy, but I'm grateful for his love. I hope that if you can hear my voice, if you can see my face, that you understand that in the middle of COVID-19, you are facing conviction. God is calling you to make some remarkable decisions, some life-altering choices. He's calling and provoking you to reevaluate what you're going to do for the rest, and hear this, not of your life, but what you're going to do the rest of the year. I read something on Twitter the other day that messed me up, said the worst investment I made was buying a 2020 planner. I can throw it all out because it's not my will. It's his will that has to be done. I want you to be convicted, not of a crime, but I want you to be convicted of your faith, convicted of your belief, convicted of your assignment. And of all of it, I hope you're convinced and convicted that New Birth is your church. Jamal Bryan is going to be my pastor. Jesus Christ is going to be my Lord. I hope you're convinced of it. Forget what it is that you agreed to in the past, what you signed to in the past, what you consented to in the past. Right now, I need you convicted. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? I'm afraid not. There's a cross for everyone. There's a cross for you. And I got to tell you, there's a cross for me as well. Our team is standing by. If you'll use uh, the prompts that are on the lower thirds of the screen, we want to walk you through what is needed and necessary for you to become a member of this ministry. Uh, you can hop on our page, newbirth.org, and go right through it. I am convinced you are not here by accident. I am convicted you are not here by happenstance, but God ordered everything in your life so you would be with me in this moment. Hear me this and hear me well. Verse 21 of Exodus chapter 1 says, uh, And then he told all the Egyptians to throw the babies out. I'm telling you, don't worry about what you're going to have to walk away from. You're still going to go on. God just needs to keep you purified and clean for your assignment. All you need, the only requirements is a clean hands and a pure heart. Would you consider sowing with us on today, investing with us on this day? I don't want you to be convicted of the question that still hasn't been answered. Can a man, can a woman rob God? Yes, they do it all the time. I don't want you to be found guilty of such. I want you, you didn't tithe on Sunday, you didn't sow on Sunday, but every day is a day of thanksgiving. Would you secure your phone right now? There are several different platforms. It's available to you right here on the screen by which you can give. Text to give, give Lafay, uh, push pay, or even on our own secure website at newbirth.org. I want to challenge every person who's been convicted that I've been stealing from God. Every good and every perfect gift comes from him, and I need to give him something. You know what I discovered? You don't even have to wait till Sunday to give, because he doesn't wait till Sunday to bless. Come on, trust God. They're believing for the next couple of days, God is going to do something unusual and mesmerizing in your life. Sunday, I'm excited about it. We're going to be taking communion together for the very first time in the quarantine. Very first time, if you're in the Atlanta metropolitan area, uh, meet me at the church between 12 and 2. I want to give you your communion receptacle so that on Sunday we can take it together. Those of you who are viewing from abroad around the diaspora, uh, find a cracker, find a potato chip, a piece of bread, 
I get some juice, but Sunday morning at 9.30 is going to be our communion celebration. We celebrate, why? Because we understand John 3, 16, God so loved the world, he gave. My father told me years ago, you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. If you love God, you ought to be giving today. You ought to be sharing today. You ought to be sowing today. You ought to be investing today. I'm convinced and I am convicted that the worst is behind and the best is yet to come. Can't wait to see you Sunday. Love somebody, hug somebody, text somebody, and stay away from everybody. Have an incredible week. God bless you. And I can't wait to see you on Sunday. You are a convicted believer. God bless you. Thank you.